Hello, everyone. Welcome to day four of DC Startup Week. Thank you, everyone, for being here, joining in to the 2 p.m. session on big and small creating strategic partnerships. I'm coming to you live from WeWork here in downtown DC. My name is Rachel Kretzky. I am one of the organizers of DC Startup Week, as well as a founder and CEO of myself of a tech company based here out of DC called UPACE. I'm so excited to be able to be here, to be able to do five full days of DC Startup Week in a virtual setting. One of the things that we're most proud of is our goal is to create a inclusive ecosystem that we support each other to survive, thrive, and grow as founders. And one of the goals is that is educational content, um, as well as bringing in great speakers, happy hours, connection, as well as networking events. One of the big things is that we focus on making DC Startup Week be completely free to make it attainable for entrepreneurs at all different levels. And we wouldn't be able to do that without some of our great sponsors. And one of those which is AERP Innovation Labs, who is curated this conversation today that helps bring together and the innovation in the DC. So thank you so much for AERP Innovation Labs. Um, I'm so excited to have this great group of panelists today. We have Kevin Morgan. He's a tech sector liaison at Washington DC Economic Partnership. He's joined by Rachel Francine, the CEO of Musical Health Technologies and a Futurist, as well as Nula Burke, a clinical lead with Walk With Path, as well as Rick Robinson from AERP Innovation Labs. So with that, please join me in welcoming Kevin, Rachel, Nula, and Rick to the DC Startup Week stage. Awesome, thank you so much, Rachel. Virtual claps and loud claps and welcome everybody who is in the audience today. Really excited to have this amazing panel to talk about big plus small, the strategic fit, uh, how startups and big company collaborations can be beneficial for companies of all sizes and stages, uh, which, right, which really helps with capital for startups and also to accelerate innovation for big companies and we're gonna discuss and navigate these partnerships and ongoing success. And for the panelists, just so you know, we had talked a little bit uh, yesterday, maybe about having background for the audience. We weren't able to get that, but I do know a gentleman named Frank is online from Uganda and he's here and developed a really cool, innovative uh, recycled plastic to usable timber, smaller company and looking really to get involved with larger corporations and figure out how to establish that. So that's one of the personas out there. For everybody quickly, our goals for this is to help uh, you understand some of the upsides and potential challenges of these type of strategic partnerships, as well as the goal of startup and corporate challenges. And we hope the takeaways today will really be best practices around forming these collaborations and really the breadth of ways that we can, uh, we can help you get connected with corporate, uh, corporate partners. What we'll do here is then I'll hand it over now to our panelists to say hello and Nula, we'll start with you and then on to Rick and then Rachel and I'll help start the conversation and step back and let the three of you take it and, and run with it. And everybody who is a participant, I am monitoring the chat window. So please feel free to put your questions in there and I'll pick and grab the ones we can to really make this interactive. And again, I'm Kevin Morgan with the DC Economic Partnership Tech Sector Liaison. And from there, Anula, I'll hand it off to you for your name, title, what you do. And this is for everybody. We talked about an interesting fact as well. So we'll, we'll go around the room, Nula, then to Rick, and then to Rachel. Nice. Thank you. Um, yes. So hi, I'm Nula. I'm the clinical lead here at Walk With Path. We're a startup that's creating wearable devices for people with chronic conditions. These wearables that we create are smart wearables. So they're innovated with a ton of different sensors that is collecting data about the way people primarily walk, and then also their psychosocial health and their mental health. So we work in different disease areas such as Parkinson's, diabetes, and our main focus is the aging population. So we're really interested in active aging. Um, thinking about a fun fact of mine, I've been coming up with a few different ideas and I think I've combined a few. So I'm both a twin and I grew up in the rainforest of Australia, but now I'm living over in Scandinavia in Copenhagen. So that one is me. Nice to meet awesome. everyone. Awesome, fantastic. Hey, uh, Rick Robinson here. Um, I am a VP of Startup Engagement for AARP's Innovation Lab. Uh, it's the innovation arm of AARP. AARP, if you don't know, is a social mission company that, among other things, helps uh, people choose how they age. 
so in the lab, we work with a lot of startups and happy to talk about how we do that today. Um, don't know if it's a fun fact, but an interesting fact about me is uh, I used to work for these things called newspapers when there was uh, newsprint and those involved big presses. And you might have seen in the movies people going and yelling, stop the presses. Uh, well, my first job out of college, I actually got to do that, yell, stop the presses. Uh, the sad fact is the, um, the pressman looked at me and just ignored me. Uh, but I did get to yell, stop the presses. Great. Um, my name is Rachel Francine. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Musical Health Technologies. We use singing as a therapeutic tool um, to treat a variety of conditions. We are mainly focused right now on cognitive decline, and we do that by combining technology where we use an evidence-based music therapy technique called lyric coaching, which prompts the words of the song to somebody right before they need to sing them um, with music therapy best practices in order to enable almost anybody to facilitate um, a therapeutic music session. And so right now, um, our main product, Sing Fit Prime, is in 500 senior living communities around the country. Um, and we have a new product coming out called Sing Fit Studio, which is a one-on-one -on -one program. Um, a fun fact about me, um, which uh, was mentioned at the beginning, is that I did go to graduate school for something called Future Studies, um, which uh, not a lot of people know even exist, but we study the probable, possible, and preferable futures. I'm mainly into the preferable futures. How do we create the future that we want rather than the future that's just handed to us? Um, and as a result, as you might guess, I'm pretty into sci-fi. So I guess the, the fun fact is I'm very eagerly anticipating season two of both The Mandalorian and Star Trek Discovery. So any sci-fi fans out there might be with me on that. Awesome, amazing, big sci-fi fan. So that's, that's great. We'll jump, uh, let's jump right into this. And, and Rick, I want to hand the first question to you is, why do large corporations work with startups? What are the advantages and, and where do you see the benefits in today yeah. as well as into the future? Yeah, my experience, uh, not only with AARP, but with other large uh, organizations that I've worked in, uh, and I have worked both with uh, as a, a startup founder and in large companies, so I've kind of seen both sides of it. But um, I think most companies get benefits uh, and do it because they're looking for an alternative approach to like an entrenched issue or a uh, product that they're trying to build but they're unable to and look to startups to help them, uh, help them do that. Um, some uh, large companies are also looking um, to you know, target issues uh, the companies are simply unable to address, um, and those are many. Um, and, you know, also startups provide, uh, let's say they, they can provide fire under the seats of people inside of large companies who may need it. Uh, and uh, that's not a primary uh, reason to work with startups, but it's uh, usually a secondary or a side effect which can have um, a very positive effect on internal motivation. So there's a couple of things uh, that come to mind there. Awesome, that's great. And then Nula, I hand it off to you to talk from you know the small company side, startup side, and then Rachel, you as well, and then we'll, we'll let the conversation unfold from there. Nula, what's, what's been your experience on the other side of that equation? Yeah, yeah, um, well, Rick, I think you make a good point there. We bring a little bit of fire, I guess. We definitely are in a startup always oozing with enthusiasm and we have a million different ideas. And the benefit, I guess, of then working with a corporate is to really be able to hone in on those ideas and make sure there's a market fit. Um, other things that I think that we can bring to a startup is that we can innovate really quickly, um, which means that we can also fail really quickly and move on from that and pivot uh, quite, quite quickly from that. Another thing of working with a corporate, I guess, is in terms of decision making. As we know, corporates, it can take a little bit longer. It has to go through a few more people. Whereas in a startup, ours has grown from three people this time last year up to 13 now. Um, but we can get a decision made in minutes. Um, we just simply look at the person next to us. So um, I think those are probably the main points a startup can bring yeah, to a um, corporate. I think I think Yulia did a really wonderful job at, at 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 covering what we what we bring. I think it is that you know that ability to to if there is a problem, um, 
if you can't solve it right away, to be able to figure out how you can solve it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to be able to really, you know, hone in on that, hone in on whatever that problem is. But I think uh, Nula did a really good job at, at covering the broad stroke, so I won't just repeat what you said. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Rich, Rick, from, from your side, how do you identify kind of these innovative startups you want to work with, like, like Newless and, and like Rachel's? Yeah, so we, uh, generally speaking, a lot of companies, large companies and associations like ours have sort of an embarrassment of riches. We have uh, a lot of companies coming to us um, who want to work with us, which is awesome. Uh, so that gives us a uh, flow that is just continuous. Um, so that's, that's one way. Uh, another way is um, uh, we and, and other companies work with accelerators who can help uh, sort of source and filter interesting startups and kind of present them to large companies and say, here, here are some that might meet your needs or help you with a strategic direction. A lot of companies tend to do that um, as a way to, to jumpstart getting involved with startups. Um, and other companies, uh, in addition to us, uh, are very proactive and we go to pitch competitions. We host pitch competitions um, and sort of source solutions ourselves, very hands-on way. Uh, so I think big companies uh, have the benefit if they just simply open their eyes and open their minds a little bit that they, they can invite in uh, startups in a lot of ways and find ways to get benefits out of them. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, there is a question that came up, and I do want to save space for, you know, really how do we make sure that, you know, we're very inclusive and including diverse founders of various backgrounds. Just quickly, Rick, is there, have you seen strategies that work from large corporations as they look to get a wide array of founders and company types, whether that's racial, gender, identity, et cetera? Is, what, have, what have you seen work well? Getting, uh, getting them connected. I think um, one of the things that we do that has been very successful is uh, cooperating with large, large and small accelerators to um, work together to source around the world startups in particular categories, themed areas. Uh, and that allows us to have a very wide net and be able to kind of source which we, we find are uh, the most appropriate who we might want to work with. Um, that makes sense. That's great. Yeah, that's that's great. That's a good start. And I do want to would like to come back to that later. And that question was from Arsalan Khan and another one from Kiana Bowie. And Rachel, I'll hand this to you and then Nula, the both of you kind of talk this out. How do you how did you gain uh, the trust of the large corporations while you were ide both identify so two parts one how do you identify large corporations to work with and two is how did you establish that relationship and build the trust with those big corporations that they knew that you were the ones they wanted to part yeah so i mean on the first question of of like how do you identify them i think that the the broader question there is is uh, you're asking is you know how do you make those deals how do those deals come to fruition and i think that you know, there's, there's three parts to that. Nula touched on one, one is patience, right? They don't work on a startup, on a startup timeline. So I think that you really have to understand that um, if you are looking at especially big organizations, I remember when we got into to senior living, somebody told me, oh, you're gonna have a three-year sales cycle. And I stamped my feet and I was like, that's not true, it is not a three-year sales cycle. And while we were able to make some smaller deals along the way, um, it took us exactly three years to make our first big nationwide sale. And so you have to know if, if that is your goal to make these big deals, that you have the runway and you have the resources to actually make those deals. Um, I think that in, in terms of, of making the connection um, with them, you know, we are, we are ninjas when it comes to um, the way conferences used to work. It's a little bit different now. But we, you know, we would do our homework, understand who the kinds of, you know, do that, that, that front end work of, of, we would apply to the conference, apply to speak, try to gain some visibility at the conference so that you could be the ones giving the talk. If you're not giving the talk, go to the, go to the sessions of the kind of partners that you want to, um, that you want to engage with. Make sure you're asking a question so that they know that you're there and or 
be that ninja who gets to the stage first, right? I know somebody who like always sits front row left at a, at a, at a you know, she gets there early and, and sits there so she can be the first person to talk to, um, to talk to, uh, to talk to the, the person. So I think, you know, it's really being bold, understanding who your audience is, doing that front load work of knowing what your value is and making sure that it attaches to what their values are. What, what does that company want? What, does, what do they need? And for our last, um, for our last uh, product, this product that we're putting out now, SingFit Studio, we actually um, reached out to a bunch of potential customers, not our top tier, but potential customers and offered their employees like a hundred dollar honorarium and said, hey, would you just talk to us? And we actually did that fact finding. Um, I, I, I would say that, um, the thing that we did to get them to trust us to answer the second part of your question, if I've answered the, the first part, is um, we over deliver at every single step of the way. So um, when we signed our first big deal, um, we had to do two different pilots with them um, in order to show them first, you know, that we could do it, that, that we could deliver the product, and then we had to do it again because they wanted to change their technology platform. And we, when, we, um, when we delivered the results to the pilots with them, we put it in a deck that was like, you know, Hollywood style, Mad Med style kind of deck to really show them not only had we gathered the data, but that we could deliver it to them in a way that showed them that we could support them, you know, long term. And they, they said that they had never gotten a presentation like that. And this is a, a quite old, you know, organization. And so, you know, to me, um, over delivering, I, I don't really know any other way to succeed um, other than, than exceeding expectations. Yeah, and I guess to play on from that, so I think Walk With Path, we're at a little bit of an earlier stage. We have one medical device on the market now, and that's uh, being sold throughout Europe with reimbursements into the healthcare industries. Um, whereas the US, we're still sort of approaching it um, and working out our market strategy. Um, but in, and with our second product, Pathfill, we're an intense R&D at this stage. So I guess where we're at in terms of linking in with larger companies is the way that we identify them is making sure we're attend, going to accelerators, um, hoping, pitching at accelerators. We did just win Mass Challenge uh, in Boston, which was super exciting. Uh, going to incubators, if there's any other big, large companies such as pharma, nonprofit, that are putting out briefs, really applying to that. And seeing how our product, that we have one idea of what we can do with it, can actually fit in with what their ideas are. Because that's a really nice way of seeing like what the market fit is, what they're looking for. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And then again, at conferences, being, I like that you call it a ninja. I feel like I'm dressed as a ninja right now. But being that person that's like running up and talking to people back when we used to be able to see people. Um, or maybe in these virtual things, I haven't figured out the ninja strategy. I guess adding them on LinkedIn really fast. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, not being afraid to approach people, I think, even though, you know, your company is a lot smaller, you can still be really interesting for them. Yeah, um, I, I, I would pile onto that, say, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the old world, if I was presenting or what have you, um, frequently there would be several people who would like to talk to me afterward. And it's usually the, the first couple uh, because of a variety of reasons you have to leave the room or what have you. Those who get there first sometimes make the, the most lasting impression. Um, uh, online, I think, uh, you know, it's, it is a lot easier. The barrier is lower to go through LinkedIn or what have you. But I would suggest that startups do their best to really kind of understand uh, the company that they're reaching out to. And whoever they're reaching out to in particular, try to understand what their pain points might be. So when you're talking to them, you can really personalize what it is that you're offering. Um, make it as easy as you can. When you're in a big company, um, it's very easy to, I don't want to say become complacent, but it's very easy to rest on the unfortunate laurels of, well, our IT department will never let us be, uh, integrate this solution mm -hmm. or the marketing team would never buy into this. But if you could target specifically to me in whatever seat I'm in to say, our solution will solve a problem for you that can get their attention. So yeah. personalizing it uh, in a very focused way, I think can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. great. That's su super helpful. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess I was just going to touch on trust and how to build that trust between small and larger companies. 
And what we think we do at Walker Path is we make sure that we're really clear about our capabilities. We like to dream really, really big, but then we have to be really honest about like, where is our product in its cycle and what can we actually do with it? And then how can we leverage our strategic relationship to build it and grow it further? Um, and so that just comes down to having really open communication. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point. Right from the get-go, before you start in, uh, working with a larger company, um, there are some watch outs. I think we all know, maybe you don't. Big companies, uh, you know, sometimes have a, a sub agenda and you got to be careful how much you, you reveal or you show up front. Uh, but then once you start working with them, you need to, as you said, uh, be transparent with what your capabilities are. Now you don't want to necessarily short yourself, but you don't want to overextend either. Um, I, uh, co-founder of a startup where we uh, we were building something we partnered with and this company actually invested in us and we started building for them and it became very clear that they wanted something new every few weeks suddenly our business was primarily focused on this partner that mm -hmm. doesn't work um, that won't work for either in the, in the end so you need to have a cultural fit but also an understanding uh, for one another um, expectations. Yeah, and I think that's something um, that is so happens relatively frequently uh, in terms of when you're working with a big company, they expect and expect and expect from a startup. And then sometimes you need to be able to stand up and say, well, actually, we are doing X, Y, and Z. And this is what we think we can create. But what is it that you're actually specifically looking for? Or like, what, how can we work together to make this a symbiotic relationship as well? Yeah. Yeah. Can I kind of follow in on that? Maybe if you could give us just the general framework that you use when evaluating, you know, is a company a good fit? I know we have a product and a service company, you know, organization here. So if you have just a general life cycle or general process, that was some of the, the one of the questions that came up in the chat is when you think about evaluating a company, what criteria are there key decision points and things like that? If there's any sort of semi structured approach to. Yeah. Well, we, we do have a pretty structured approach for how we work with them. Um, you know, let's say startup is Sassafras and uh, we, we see them pitch or we see them at a challenge that we put together and we find that they're interesting. We have an initial discussion um, and we kind of understand what their goals are and where they're trying to go and what they want to do. And does that really, um, does that overlap with ours as well? Um, also understand importantly, is it a cultural fit? Um, is this founder or these founders, um, are, they, uh, are they both hard charging and really focused and creative and interested and ideally passionate about the age tech space, which is a primary area for us? Uh, or are they just looking to kind of jump on the back of a, a large corporation, which Understandably, some startups uh, just want to do that. So we look for that. And we try to make sure that there's authenticity there. Um, and we have a process where they can come into our kind of accelerator for a period of time um, where they can get some feedback. They can uh, have the benefit of our design thinking team work with them on a, whatever problem they're working on. Um, and at the end of that, we can determine uh, in my group, is this something that we feel like we can work together to build something brand new, or we can take what they have and really blow it up to a much larger, larger market. Um, so we feel like in that dating period, we're able to understand whether or not there's a, there's a good fit. That's great. Rachel, do you, from the small, smaller company perspective and then Nula as well, do either of you, and I'll start with you, Rachel, have a framework that you use to evaluate a larger corporation, right? Because it's not just a one, a unidirectional relationship. It's a bi-directional partnership and hopefully the, the give and take is, is somewhat equal on each side. I mean, I think for, I think for us, it's, it, it goes back to that, that question of, uh, you know, are the values aligned? And, and are they aligned all the way through the, the flow of getting that product to market? So, you know, we, you know, we've evaluated companies where we say, okay, you know, we might have this great champion who loves our company, right? But then 
you know, they want to create something, but then what happens after they love it and bring it into the company? Who's actually going to be out there selling the product? And, you know, a lot of times, you know, that person who, who's going to actually be, because if you're talking about working with a big company, you know, typically you're going in and you're working with a group, right? And, and whoever that group is, then has subgroups underneath them, maybe sales teams, for example. So really understanding the, the entire flow of the product um, in distribution to sales. Because for example, what we found working with a couple distributors was that the way that our product was sold didn't really allow for a great um, commission, right? For their end salespeople. So their end salespeople weren't necessarily incentivized. They were used to selling like, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of widgets, for example, right? And so they weren't necessarily incentivized to sell a services oriented uh, product. And so, you know, while we were able to sort of create a new product that worked for that organization, eventually it took a while for us to, to create that alignment. And we really learned that lesson from them of, of really understanding what, what their internal mechanisms are. Because I don't, I don't necessarily know that, that we have like a one size fits all, but it's really a discovery process of just making sure because, because like Nula and I were talking about earlier, we can pivot really quick. We can change certain things about our products to make them fit with that larger organization. But at the end of the day, if, that, if, if, the, if the larger organization doesn't fit us, that's, that's the bigger problem. And then you've spent a ton of money on lawyers and contracts and all kinds of things only not to have it work out in the end mm -hmm. yeah and um yeah i completely agree with rachel um we wouldn't necessarily have a framework per se but it really is about seeing that your values and goals are aligned in the fact that at the end of the day in our startup we want to bring our products to market and by linking in and having these strategic relationships that's what is going to help us get there alongside you know providing benefit to these larger companies and, you know, the companies we'll work for is, you know, a not-for-profit. Um, it might be a research institute then. So then you're looking at things like IP. Um, it might be a big pharma. And then you're looking at where does your medical device or product end at the end of that line. Um, so it really is looking at where, how you can fit in with each other and then make sure that you're both working towards a goal that will be beneficial for you both. That's great. Rick, from the larger side, De-risking in, in my conversation with executives keeps coming up is how do we de-risk these partnerships? Is there anything that you look at in particular, either internally in corporation or with the companies as de-risking strategies? Alternately, way to say it is to make sure it, this is successful. What are the key areas of failure you consider and, and how to work yeah. around them? Uh, I think one, one important thing that larger companies should do when they're talking to a startup about potentially working together is um, gauging whether that founder or that team uh, feels willing uh, to pivot if they need to pivot. And that's, that's um, not necessarily specifically what you can determine right up front, but you can determine whether they are uh, they're nimble and smart and realistic because uh, frequently you could get in uh, involved with the startup and find that the direction that you thought together that you would go in isn't really where you end up needing to go and you need to switch directions. Uh, and ideally you're able to work with startups who are willing to make that uh, change, let's say. That's an important way to de-risk. The reason I bring that up is um, my feeling is if you're a big company and your first thought is thinking of how to de-risk, you ought to just forget it. Um, don't even bother, don't waste startup time. Um, you need to go in there with the expectation that there is risk and you should embrace that. That's how great things get built, by taking chances, by taking risks. And if you start from that point of view, uh, let's, let's find a way to you know, make sure we, we uh, avoid losses here. My, uh, my opinion and my uh, suggestion to you is get out of the game, get out of our way. Yeah, I, I really just, good advice. Really. Yeah, I, I would add in there that one of the questions we've learned to ask when we're talking to larger organizations is, can you tell us about some startups you've worked with before and mm -hmm. some success stories and and, you know, making sure that they've actually been able to to create, you know, have that process where 
they can successfully integrate with a startup because you, your, your time really, I mean, when we, when we first started, we wasted, you know, a couple months just, you know, writing white paper after white paper after white paper, you know, for an organization that we later found out, you know, really wasn't any good with, with working with startups. So um, finding out, do they have a successful history of doing that? And are they willing, as Rick was saying, to take those risks? Yeah. What about it? One of the, the questions that keeps coming up, and this is whether it's taboo or not, the, the big concern, some of the concerns the exec, uh, startup founder has been asking is, what about IP protection? I think there's, you know, the Winchell Wiper by Ford, which was, uh, you know, the lawsuit I think was just settled uh, after many, many years. What about IP protection in, in making sure that really there is that honest brokerage between between the two organizations? Nuala, do you want to start with that? And, and we'll hand Absolutely. Um, I guess in the really early initial stages of working with a, a larger company is that anything that you do show needs to be, you're happy that it's completely public and it's non-confidential. And then when you're starting to get into a lot more in-depth conversations, the first thing, of course, is to have an NDA signed. And I mean, who knows how protective that actually is, but it's a really, really safeguard. I think for the large company and for ourselves to know that we're moving into sort of confidential territory. And then from there, depending what your relationship is, that's where you need to obviously have contracts created um, with lawyers as well. So whether it's, for example, we have a clinical study happening uh, over here in the UK. And with that, there was a lot of back and forth in terms of what you own, what information and research um, is owned by the research facility, owned by us, and where you can move forward with your product along with different patents, things like that. And then, of course, you know, if you're talking to pharma or different big co uh, companies like that, it's really just a long back and forward conversation that you need to have. And you need to be quite protective of it, of course. Yeah, it's, it's hard to it's hard to establish trust sometimes with mm -hmm. uh, with big companies. Uh, you can uh, establish trust with individuals within those companies uh, yeah. as a startup. Um, but you might find that there's others. Uh, behind that person who may not be quite as trustworthy. So NDAs can be helpful um, uh, working incrementally by not giving everything away first mm -hmm. um, can also be uh, a tactic. Um, but you want to get to a point where the, the, the cup of the big company is just as uh, kind of invested in whatever the solution is as you. So they're reliant on you. Um, so not always easy to do, but that's sort of an ideal situation. And, and also looking into the reputation of the company, because, you know, there have been companies that have reached out to us or that we, you know, that we've gotten into discussions with and, and they're not as willing to sign an NDA, you know, even in those, you know, and, and you just, you know, you start looking into it, you start asking your contacts and your colleagues what they know about the organization. And then you find out, yeah, no, they, they sometimes aren't, aren't so straight up. And then, you know, sometimes you just have to cut bait. Yeah, I, that's, that's good advice. And there's lots of ways to, to find out. Mostly, um, you know, uh, I have had some unfortunate experiences with companies. Uh, one in particular, uh, we'll call it COFET. Um, they, uh, they engaged with my startup with a lot of overtures around um, acquisition. And it turns out after a lot of meetings and a lot of revealing what we were working on, they just um, co-opted what we did and built it and sent us away. So it was a good learning experience. Had mm -hmm. we uh, done our homework, we might have uh, known a little bit more about the trustworthiness of that particular company. So mm -hmm. good And advice. I think, so, um, you know, the startup uh, area is small but large. And so reach out to anyone that you know about, you know, different companies that they've worked with. You know, if you're part of any accelerator or incubator alumni, for example, just ask them if they've heard of this company and what their experiences have been as well. Can we, this is super helpful. We've had some additional questions. One of the things I wanted to ask is sometimes, you know, between a large company and a small company, there's a disparity between resources, whether small companies are working hard, being scrappy and giving a lot away for free and aren't necessarily, 
cash flow is an issue, paying the bills, keeping the food on the table and things like that. What should a healthy, you know, uh, relationship look like between a small company and a large corporation in terms of getting paid for your innovation and your testing, or even sharing of resources from the large corporation, dedicated engineers, things like that. What, any thoughts on that? And um, Rick, maybe you start with this and, and Rachel and, and Nula, we'll, we'll go from there. Well, it may be a little unusual, but I'd like to, as much as I can, uh, you know, large company, when we work with startups is uh, engage the startup as sort of an adjunct of our group um, to the extent even where we may support them with helping out product development, helping out, of course, with research and other things that we, we commit to doing, but some things that are on the fringes, um, maybe even guiding them on how to, how to message properly and all these sorts of things where um, I, I think that's something that in other experiences in larger companies, uh, they just haven't really thought about doing. So uh, really linking arms and treating them as partners in, in the goal, whatever that goal is, um, rather than kind of thinking of them as service providers that um, are, are there to do your bidding or to achieve a goal for you and then move on. I think it's much much more successful when you're working together uh, mm -hmm. and providing uh, sometimes things that are, you know, uh, may just be an odd request from a startup. They don't have the resources to do X, Y, or Z. And uh, while it's not in a contract, it's not something you discussed, but it's, in my opinion, something that you find a way to get for that startup in, in, the, um, in the effort to have, achieve the goal together, which is, the success of whatever it is you're working on. Yeah, That's great. I, um, for us, I think, you know, we made a we made this decision early on because a lot of times what will happen is, you know, people will ask for free pilots, right? So, you know, we and and so we made a decision early on that it was we had to get something out of it. So for the most part, we wouldn't agree to a free pilot unless that organization was willing to do research with us so that we were actually able to get something out of that. And then also I think that the, the next step to that, especially if you're working with a bigger organization, is making sure that if you are doing something for free, because sometimes you have to, right? They wanna see some step that you're taking forward to really agree on, okay, if we achieve, right? If we achieve those benchmarks, then what happens? And, and that way really being able to sort of you know, as much as a small company can with a big company, but hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, well, we, you know, we hit all of those benchmarks that you wanted. And you said, if we hit these, then you would do X, Y, Z. And to have that plan in place before you just kind of go, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. You know, because you're excited about, you know, working with that marquee, with that marquee company and, and mm -hmm. having that, because if you go out to raise money and all you're doing is sort of talking, let's say to an organization, a venture capitalist isn't going to, you know, isn't going to put any more value on your company because you're talking to a big company. They're going to want to know that you have some sort of plan in place to work with them long term. Gotcha. Nula? Yeah, yeah. I, Rachel, I completely agree um, with what you're saying. So um, there is always that excitement when you're in a startup and you're talking to a big company and you're talking about pilots. Um, and obviously, it's so easy to say, yes, we're going to do all of this and throw everything at them. And then you sit back and you're like, okay. Wow, let's rein that in. Um, if perhaps it's not initially a paid pilot, what's really important, just like you said, Rachel, is getting that data and that research out and saying, okay, if it's not going to be paid, but we're going to get cost effectiveness out of this by saying, you know, using our device or using our product will lower the cost of your healthcare service, for example. Um, so that's really important. And then a really big thing that we learned with our Walk with Path after, you know, really being involved in the US market is don't be afraid to ask for paid pilots. I think that's a really big thing. Um, and then working with other companies such as, you know, in co-development, for example, it's not a paid relationship that we have, but we have access to resources where we can advance our product so much further than we could have previously. You know, focus groups, one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with experts that they've used their network to bring together for us. Um, 
along with things like policy, being able to talk to policymakers in health, how do we get FDA approval, looking into coding coverage, all of these different aspects that big companies can help you with, that as a startup, you're learning on the go where you can actually go to their experts. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point, uh, if I can key off of that. Uh, some large companies may not even realize the values that they've got internally until the startup maybe specifically says, I need this or that. So for instance, we offer uh, research, uh, access to data, uh, as I mentioned, support with product development, business planning, invitations to conferences, all these things that we offer to our startup partners. Other big companies could do the same. Maybe they haven't thought about it. So I think it's important for startups to think about what are the things specifically that I should request? Because it may not be a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it may just be the lack of imagination on the side of the big company. Uh, which is why they haven't suggested or offered it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one thing as well. When you're approaching a big company, like, don't be afraid. Give them a wish list. Like, this is every single thing that we want to do with you. Can we do it? And then often they can be like, actually, we didn't think about these, the different things we can do. Yeah, we can probably do a lot of them. And then you're secretly like, yes, that's awesome. It's worked out really well. So, yeah, don't yeah. be afraid of us. Rick, totally. can I ask you, so... One of the pieces we haven't talked about in any depth is organization like ARP Innovation Labs, where you provide support and help really coach companies through that. And I remember when the uh, Innovation Lab opened up, I guess in 2018, it's been such a great addition to the companies and our ecosystem. Could you explain a little about the process that you go through, the resources you provide uh, at the uh, Innovation Center? And that would be so helpful. Yeah, sure. Uh, the lab has been around for about four years, actually. So we do a lot of things, um, uh, primarily geared toward um, solving un unmet needs, solving problems, meaning, you know, um, but working with startups to do all of that. And there's a lot of ways we engage with them. Uh, we uh, sponsor and put together pitch competitions, uh, challenges, um, we work with accelerators and we do this throughout the year as a way to target and find startups that are uh, in particular areas, themes that we put out um, that are supporting our mission, supporting our goals. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to engage, as I said, throughout the year, finding uh, companies who we feel would be appropriate and are interested and passionate about what we're trying to do. Uh, and then we, we kind of bring them in and um, uh, our teams uh, engage with them on what is it you're trying to do? Here's what we're trying to do. Let's understand, uh, are there some big problems you're trying to solve? Are there some things with your company that you're trying to work out that you haven't been able to before we can even engage on, let's say a co-created product or something else. And through that process, uh, we're able to, that's sort of, as I mentioned before, kind of the dating process. We're able to understand with these companies, is this something, is this, are these, these folks uh, someone we'd like to work with long term? We'd like to do something bigger with. Um, and if that's the case, uh, we then talk to them about a couple of things, maybe a co-creation, and that could be, you've got this product, uh, our audience is over here, the $6 trillion age tech opportunity over here. If you were able to uh, turn your product a little bit or add a, a uh, uh, additional service, you could, um, you could meet the needs of this audience. Let's work together on that. And we would provide the product expertise, the business expertise, the research, um, and all this sort of thing to help startups uh, build something to meet that market. And where we're going with that is, we may invest directly in the startup to help them do that. Um, additionally, we may uh, co-create and develop a product that they own and, and uh, they go off uh, as part of our portfolio going forward, but they go off and, uh, and, and try to make that X product successful. Um, so you know, we may engage with or interact with 100 companies in the year, um, and we may end up working with 20 to 30. Um, and out of those, we may have a handful of co-created products. But in the end, all of those who we agree to do something with are then part of our portfolio. And they will have, into the future, access to us and what I hope is our expertise. And 
our guidance and our mentorship and so on. So, um, so yeah, uh, I think those are some ways that we're able to help. That's fantastic. And yeah, the wonderful. And I hope everybody on here, uh, I know Sheila is on, if you could put how to contact, uh, the innovation lab, how to get in touch, Rachel Nula. If you have your LinkedIn profiles, put them in there. You want to share any information. I think we're, we're back. We have about 10 minutes left, nine minutes now. Uh, and I want to make sure we save, uh, take these minutes to really talk about key pieces of advice um, from each of you for, you know, taking on these type of partnerships. And Nula, I'll start with you. So if you have one, two or three um, really important bullet points that, you know, our entrepreneurs that are on right now should keep in mind, as well as if you have an ask offer. If you have an ask that you need from this group, something you want information and are willing to offer, whether that's uh, advising, you know, specific founders, et cetera. So we'll I'll literally go through the line. So Nula, you're up and then Rick and then Rachel as well. No worries. I was just trying to find my LinkedIn, but that's fine. I'll do it later. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess our recommendations is, yeah, be like, super transparent, authentic, show your enthusiasm, because I really think that right, right back at the start of this was like, bring your fire to these large companies and get them really excited about change that you can make, because we can create a lot of change if we can create strong strategic relationships together. Having a small company and a big company together is perfect in terms of resources, agility from the startup, expertise from the bigger company. So um, I think enthusiasm is one. Don't stop if your first uh, relationship with a big company doesn't work out. In fact, don't stop if the first 10 don't work out. Like, keep going as much as you possibly can. When you're in R&D of products like we are with one of our products, look into the areas where bigger companies can help you. And then when obviously you're further down and looking into market entry and starting to sell, that's when you need to start also looking at, you know, different companies and when they fit into it. One uh, relationship might take you all the way from the start down to the end. Um, and then, yeah, don't be afraid to ask big things and uh, try and reach out to any of the startup networks that you're in, such as in DC. It's super strong, just like uh, all of the different programs, accelerators and incubators that are going on. Um, what was the next thing? Ask offer. So, I mean, we're based here in Copenhagen and in the UK. So if anyone needs any um, sort of access into Europe, we've got quite a large network here in terms of health tech, startups. Um, and ask, I guess, you know, we're always looking at further relationships in the active aging sector um, and any piloting as well. So always really interested in that. Great. Thank you so much. Super helpful. Rick? Uh, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that uh, we are focused primarily on fintech and health tech. Doesn't mean we don't diverge from that, but that's a good thing for people to be aware of. Um, we also offer, I didn't mention, we also offer uh, what we refer to as these test beds, these environments that we uh, have partnerships with that allow us to uh, have our startups trial their products in market within these test beds. Uh, so that that's a pretty attractive thing we found for for startups. Um, I would say that um, you know uh, make make sure you don't think of our audience when you think of specifically working with us. Thinking of AARP, don't you know? Don't think of our audience as a monolithic uh, block. Um, you know, people who are 50 uh, have have sometimes different needs from people who are 75, and try to keep that in mind when you're, uh, when you're maybe pitching your product. Um, and, you know, you can reach us. I think the other question was, where do you get us? We're uh, at aarpinnovationlabs.org. Sorry about the length. Um, but you can find on that site where you can uh, sign up for a pitch competition or a challenge and, uh, as a way to meet us. Rick, before we, Rachel, before we go to you, just wanted to, Rick, could you just clarify quickly what you mean by test bed? Sure. So let's say uh, it's, a, it's an environment where you could do a clinical test or it's uh, uh, what we call a CCRC, uh, retirement community, where you can take your product and put it in that environment and actual consumers in that environment will test it for a period of time and determine is this something that that should be alive in the world or not. Gotcha, great, thank you. There you go, Michael, that's the answer to your question. Uh, Rachel, you're up. Um, I, I would say my, my bullet points would be um, 
if you're if if you're still in the idea phase of of entrepreneurship and considering what you're going to do to really do your research in the market and make sure that there aren't a ton of other companies out there um, that are in the startup phase that are doing exactly the same thing that you want to do. I, I find having been in the startup in in especially the eight, you know the aging space for eight years now that we see these waves of different products coming through and you'll see a lot of the same products coming out. And, um, and, and for me personally, I would not be very good at taking an idea that's similar to somebody else and differentiating it just a little bit and having that wherewithal and that passion to be out there every day saying why we're a little bit different and a little bit better. I think, you know, really finding your unique niche and with that being able, my second point would be being able to tell that unique story. I think that part of what got us to, to where we are is that we, we have a, a unique product and a unique story to tell about it. And it was able to kind of elevate us um, above some of the noise of, of other companies. We, we won a lot of pitch competitions early on and that was able to propel us forward. Um, once, you, once you have those two things and you're sort of sure of yourself and you are in that process of, of working with big organizations, um, I, I, I'm actually gonna steal this advice um, from somebody that I, I heard talk at a conference um, and it was somebody from Philips and they said, um, land and expand. So once you are mm -hmm. in with an organization, um, make sure that, you know, you um, not only are you expanding, um, you know, at, at that time, but keep those relationships um, that you have with everybody who works at that company. We had done an early, um, an, an early deal um, early in our, in our life with a very large organization. And unfortunately they had trouble with the project and had to drop it, but we stayed in touch with the person who signed that deal with us that we actually did get paid for. And we're now back in conversations with that company. That person's no longer there, but we just had the best conversation with her this morning where she was able to give us some inside scoop on really what to do and, and how to do it. And so I think that that, that those would be those would be my my pieces of advice, the most important of which is in, in terms of the, the uh, topic of this uh, talk is, is the land and expand. Um, in terms of, of my offer and ask, um, similar, similar to Nula, the ask is always, hey, you know, we're out there um, selling um, our, our products. Um, right now we are looking at um, um, places that are particularly interested in cognitive decline um, and, and getting reimbursed for um, uh, speech language pathologists and occupational therapists who want new tools that can have reimbursement. Um, my offer would be, um, I'm actually speaking on Friday at a, at a uh, uh, virtually of course, at a, at a conference called the Serendipity Conference. And this is particularly for female um, founders and female entrepreneurs. Um, it, it, can, it is um, statistically more difficult, both for female entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of, of color. Um, so I'm open to, you know, he hearing um, uh, the ups and downs and giving whatever advice I can from my perspective to pretty much any entrepreneur, but, but, but particularly Amazing. women and, and people of color and, and people from other marginalized, um, you know, sometimes marginalized Fantastic. communities. Thanks so much, Rachel, and uh, everybody, Nula and Rick, for being on here. Rachel Kresge, I see you're back on. We've got to wrap up. And a special thank you. So uh, one strategic partnership we have is the ASL interpretation is being provided by Jeannie, which uh, Jeannie is actually a D.C.-based company, and we're willing to step up and really do this on the fly. And so they do mobile interpretation, both multiple languages, as well as now uh, we worked really hard, and Rachel in particular worked hard to bring them in. So that's a perfect example of what we've been talking about, a scrappy startup offering a service that's now reaching, you know, 100 events live in, in 40 hours. So Rachel Koreski, I'll hand it over to you. Again, thank you, everybody. Please go to aarpinnovationlabs.org, sign up. And if you have any questions or, you know, want to run your idea, fill out the forms there, and, and it'll get routed to the right person. Rachel, it's up to you. Thank you Thanks, so Kevin. much, Kevin, Rick, Rachel, Nula, and Stephanie, our ASL interpreter. Thank you so much for an honest conversation today on how to create big and small partnerships. So I really appreciate you guys coming together and speaking. Thank you so much, Jessica from the AARP Innovation Labs team and Sheila for bringing together this amazing group of speakers. Thank you for all the attendees for being here, asking questions and engaging over the chat. 
Um, thank you, Kevin, in particular, because of you, we were able to have ASL interpreting throughout the week of creating that relationship between DC Startup Week and Genie. So I'm so appreciative of you. We have a jam packed schedule the rest of the afternoon for DC Startup Week day four. Uh, working off at 3 p.m., we have Building the Future of Great Remote Work, Three Challenges to no Negotiation Success in Challenging Times, Getting Started with KPIs, Metrics that You Need to Manage and Scale Your Startup. And then at 3.30, we're kicking off the relevance of ad agencies for startups in 2020. So take a look at the schedule, grab those Zoom links. Thank you guys so much for being here as well. We'll see you soon.